Good morning, afternoon, or evening, whatever it is for you. I'm Cyclone, and this is Let's Play Training Simulator. We're going to play our only scenario in the uh, Sherman Hill pack, the initial set of six. Now, if we look down you'll, in the uh, over in the career tab, you'll see that there are some other ones that uh, are career scenarios. But in the uh, original set of six, which are all standard, this is the only scenario that uses the EMD SW10 switcher. It is the Union Pacific model. There are many others, of course. But we're going to be using, as you can see in the picture here, switcher number 96, originally switcher number 1243. Let's go inside the scenario. Let's take a look at this switcher and we're gonna do a uh, run of that scenario with that switcher right now. I'll see you in the scenario. We're gonna start with the train tour. So as you can see, we are starting in the Cheyenne yard today. If I bring out the map here, you're gonna be able to see that this is exactly where we are. The train is located right here on an individual little stub track here. We're gonna start by giving you a tour of the train. So let's just zoom in on the train a little bit here. This is where we're located. And we'll start the scenario itself in a moment, but for right now, I want to start by giving you a tour of the train. I'll tell you more about the train itself as we get into the scenario. So let's get inside the cab and we'll take a look. So the main features I want to point out are some of the uh, different controls here. For example, here is, uh, these are the brake pressure valves. These are pretty standard. So you have the uh, equalizing reservoir, the brake pipe pressure and that. And uh, right now you can see the brakes are on. If I were to bring up the HUD, the brakes are on. We're at 84, 84 setting on each of those right now just under that 95 marker, or 85 marker there. So those are the uh, brake pipes and uh, reservoirs and such. And uh, that's just, this uh, device, I have to remember the name of it, ammeter I believe it is. It shows how much power you're using at that moment in time that you're going. We do have, well, since I highlighted them, I might as well show you, there's the uh, throttle which has, uh, if I do this, you'll see that it has multiple steps. You can see it goes up to step number eight. That's the maximum throttle on this switcher. Let's reset that to idle. You heard the engine come to life there for a moment. We have the reverse, which obviously goes forward and back. So there's forward, there's back. Uh, we have different controls here for the number lights. You can see that those work. We have the cab light, which is on, and we have the uh, beacon light, which I'm not gonna use, not for this particular purpose anyway. So that's the main controls over on this side of the cab. There is, uh, that doesn't do anything. That button is useless. Not even modeled anyway. Uh, this is, by the way, is the front of the cab. You would think that's kind of weird because uh, you think the front of the cab would be this side, but then we're going backwards. So keep in mind, this is the front of the cab. You can see if you look in the gut, in the thing, we are kind of facing our guys back here. If we turn this around, you'll see them facing forward. So yeah, that is the front of the cab going in that direction. You want to put the reverse in a forward position to lead, not the other way. So let's uh, look at the brakes over here. We do have an independent brake down here which uh, I'm not, I could probably just use that, but I'm gonna go ahead and eventually keep this train brake on a small application so I can just ride this brake. It's a lot easier to drive riding this brake without having to worry about speeding and such as you go. So you're gonna see me doing a bit of riding on that brake. The horn's up here. There's also a bell. You can see the little uh, thing moving down here. That's where the bell is located right there. So if I highlight it right here, there you go, that's the bell. Uh, we also have a few other controls down here. The headlights are somewhere over here as well, actually. The headlights I forgot to point out over here. That's where the headlights are located. Because it is daytime, we don't care. We're not gonna be using those. Uh, road cross, I forget that. Uh, something was still highlighted there. We do have the sander over here. Yep, sander control. And there's a couple other little odd controls in here as well, which I seem to be, I may have been I may be forgetting where those other controls are, but if I, uh, that was the bell, I believe. Yeah, that's the bell. But there might be a couple other controls in here as well, but that's the majority of the controls that we're gonna need. We're not gonna really need too many more controls. So let's go ahead and get the scenario started and we will get this thing going. We'll get this motor purring. Hi again. There will be a special train using the UP Heritage Fleet later today and your job is to help with the fueling. In switcher number 96, you have several jobs which will take you around Cheyenne. You will also learn some tips for understanding your task list and how to navigate complex yards. You mean the thing that I'm about to bring up and show off what we're doing today? Yes, I know how this works. Uh, we're going to ignore that because he's going to give us a tour of the cab, how to navigate around the HUD. So the HUD is just normal stuff like this. Uh, it's telling you that you can bring up the task list which I'm highlighting in the bottom right here. There's also a coupling view here which we can use if we need to and we also have the actual 2D map if we can just push 9 to access. So we're not worried about that. Uh, that can go away. 
The only feature about this tab, this uh, junk, this uh, message is the second line of the third paragraph, which talks about, as there are no junctions behind you. Spelling was a major thing in this game, obviously. That's all for now. You should be able to get to the heritage fueling siding anyway. The coal has been unloaded, so there is an empty car which needs moving. Make your way there by going straight over the turntable table and reversing back into the heritage fueling siding. And couple up, and I'll see you shortly. All right, so uh, I'm going to use the head out the window view if I can get it activated here. There we go. Let's uh, turn this guy into place. Like I said, I'm going to go ahead and leave the brake on just because I, uh, with a train that has air brakes like this, I prefer to keep it on a brake applied setting. I need to put the reverse or forward. I probably forgot that step. And I'm going to just manage the speed momentarily at this uh, five mile per hour. It's easier to manage the speed this slow if you keep the brake applied. I find. It's also good for going down a hill, which I think I talked about in the uh, previous scenario as well, which was the air reduction scenario. The broken air reduction scenario, which I basically Frankenstein into a working version by changing a couple settings. It's actually a little harder to maintain a uh, small speed here, so I'll be happy when I get into that 10. As you see, I'm just bumping that speed up and down quite a bit here. You can actually coast at 5 very easily, so it's probably easier to just coast at 5 and then move to 10 when you can get to 10. Because I'm doing a lot more massaging of the uh, throttle here than I normally would have to. Down. I don't think we're going to be at the 10 in time to bump it up again, but we're just going to live with it. One more drop. This might not be enough. No, I need one more drop. Now we can go. I should be able to get up to 10 now. There we are. 10 is our current limit. So, let's get ourselves stopped up here. And then as I back into the uh, wagon that we need to back into, I'll go ahead and I will sh tell you more about the train at that point. By the way, the switch ahead of us is set. I'm going to show you more about... Uh, I I'm going to show you more uh, about how to get these, uh, check these switches and make sure you're going in the right direction. We didn't really do that on the Suburban Glasgow that much, just in one scenario. So this will be a really good way for me to introduce uh, switching cable to you. And then we get to other scenarios later, like on Cahun, Donner, and other places with big yards. We're going to get to see uh, more complex switching operation here. So let's go ahead and get past this switch here. Drop one more time, because now I want to start slowing down anyway. Forget the 15. We're going to slow down a little more again. Down to 5 should be fine at this point. I can move up a little bit more. I'm going to stop here. Because as you can see, the back of the train is now past my point. Actually, I'll go a little bit more. Just give me a little extra room. But I am past the point, so I will now hit the switch. And I'm going to go ahead and just ride the train backwards as I tell you more about this train. Why not? Put the train in reverse. So, this, uh, in 1978, Union Pacific did a review and concluded that the railroad needed more, um, around 60 new yard switchers. So, this was, uh, the type of yard switcher that was created. Is this seeing locomotives from the SW7, SW9, and TR5A rosters were identified for use in this upgrade program, program to create the so-called new... SW10 that we are seeing here. We're going to be backing. I want to make sure I maintain my speed, so let's make sure we cover that carefully. So this uh, this one is number 1243. I know you're saying it says 96, but it is originally number 1243. This one survived to Heritage Days, so this is now uh, renumbered to uh, number 96. It was renumbered in uh, 1998, and it is part of the Heritage Fleet. So this one survived into preservation, and it's still used to this day as a preserved train. Now I haven't seen any information on whether this train made its way into the museum since this DLC came out. This information is as of 2012. So uh, this DLC has been out for a while. This train may have some more information related to it. I've had a hard time finding this on Wikipedia though. So I'm kind of relying on some other information I was able to find. Um, a lot of uh, SW trains were made by EMD, Electric Motors Division, but I couldn't find this one on the Wikipedia page, which is kind of strange. So uh, maybe I'm just looking in the wrong spot. I didn't find the SW1000, the SW1200. Might have been a 1200 actually, but I didn't find a way to confirm this 
locomotive was part of either of those lists, so... Eh. I'll get the information I can, and I'll just get what I can here. Let's slow down again, because we are getting close to the coupling point. I don't want to have my throttle on as I back into this train, because I did somehow send this wagon flying once. I don't know how. Not this time. You're not doing too badly. Clear this sign by dropping the car off in Cheyenne Old Levin. Don't stray out of the main line and nudge past those signals ahead. There's plenty of room. Let's show you how the switching works right now before I continue to talk about the train. We're going to be coming up to this signal right here. You might be noticing that uh, if you remember the career scenarios we did in suburban Glasgow, you don't get to see these signals on the map most of the time. In a standard scenario, you get to see these signals. We'll ignore the fact that sometimes in Sherman Hill they're wrong, but these ones are correct. Um, so this red signal here is we're going to be stopping at this red signal. We're going to be coming and eventually moving this switch to move over to that direction. All of our switches are clear for us to theoretically go on the main line, but we're not allowed on the main line because of the signal. And sure enough, you can see the junction is set against us anyway, so we can't go on to the main line. So we're going to make our way in that direction. Let's go ahead and do that right now. Nudge that throttle up to 10 a little quicker this time. And we're going to lower that speed a little bit here. So, I want to talk a little bit about the need for these particular uh, models as the uh, as it was needed. So, uh, Frank D. Accord was uh, the power, was the motive power chief of Union Pacific from 1971 until his retirement in June of 1980. Not long before I was born, actually. Uh, uh, he used, wanted to simplify the railroad's locomotive roster. So, uh, the roster was all purchased while David S. Newhart was the general superintendent of the railroad's motive power and machinery department from April 1949 to September of 1971. Uh, this included many odd and one-of-a-kind types of units, including the gas turbine that I think we're going to see uh, in this uh, DLC as well, as included with the package after some time passed. So the 6900 class centennials were there, the other double diesels were there. So he wanted to get, Frank Accord wanted to get down just a few standard models. That was his goal with uh, simplifying the roster. I'm going to keep an eye on our signal ahead here so we don't go past it. So the new switcher, the form the new switcher would take was determined by five choices. The railroad could either buy new locomotives or uh, rebuild with, well, the main ones were buy new locomotives or rebuild the locomotives. And they decided, obviously, to rebuild them. So, uh, the, so um, that's the main part of it. The SW-10 arrived again in 1978, I believe I said, yes. Uh, with a fleet of about 60 dedicated yard switchers at that time. We're coming close to the signal, so we're going to stop right now. Going to get to the point zero. We should be fine. This should be good. Right here. Stop here. And there. Yeah, we're going to push it a little bit far here. Just to make sure we do clear the uh, switch. I know, we're, I know we're generally fine, but I take as much room as I need to, and then I stop. That'll do. So we're going to get to the back, we're going to hit this switch. That's not the switch. That's not the back. This is the back. So as you can see when we get to the back now, we are clear of this now. We can go ahead and hit this. And we can go backwards. So I'm going to put the reverser into backwards. We should check the next switch while we're at it, so I'm going to center on where I am. And as you can see, we are going into old 11, which is exactly where we're supposed to go. So we're going to start backing up right now. I'm going to keep this slow, even though we're in a 15, because we're not too far away from our destination. So, uh, yeah, the 60 yard switchers are down just the one now, obviously, for this model. The rest have been, uh, I think the majority of the rest of them have been scrapped at this point, or rebuilt again. And, uh, yeah, there's just so much information about this, I'm not even going to try to read all of this. You can actually go to utahrails.net, you can do a Google search for the SW10 switcher. And you'll find the utahrails.net has a lot of information about this, including some of the information I just gave you. So you can actually do a lot of reading at utahrails.net about this switcher if you want to learn more about it. If I remember, I'll include the link in the description. But if I don't remember, then, uh, like I said, you just go ahead and Google it, and you'll get more information there. I would go to trains. Uh, the train site as well, the magazine, but unfortunately their uh, information on the SW10 is limited to subscribers only, so I'm not going to link to that because... You have to subscribe to be able to get that information, and I don't want to uh, necessarily try to suggest that people pay for information I'm trying to give you for free here. 
Besides, a lot of it is probably similar to what Utah Rails has, so... Yeah, just get what information you can. So I'm going to go ahead and back up a fair distance here just to make sure we are good and within the uh, back here. We're on the straight track now, so we should be good here. Let's just get back to the front of the train. We don't need to go all the way into the buffer. Going to move the reversal forward so I'm ready to go when I disconnect. And there we go. We're paused again, so now... Your next task is to go to Cheyenne Old 8 to get to Diesel Pump 1. This, mo this involves throwing a few switches, so I'll show you how to do this on the map. I already had to do this. You're a little late on this. Uh, close your company view with a... Yeah, yeah, yeah. 2D map. To get You need to get to Diesel Pump 1 via Cheyenne Old 8. Okay, yep, I'm aware. Uh, and so on and so forth. That's just tutorials. So we're going to let the train move forward without our wagon. Gonna go ahead and bump the uh, page up a little bit. So let's talk about when the uh, this train retired, because again, this one survived for preservation. Uh, nine SW10s of the fleet of 75 turned into 75 eventually, had left the roster. 10, 15 were built in 1980 as part of a rebuild program after the original 60, so there were 75. Uh, nine of them had left the roster by 1995. And the SW10-1205 was wrecked in mid-1981, so they actually lost one that way as well. So 10 were gone. The damage was repaired for that one in July 1981 by using a retired SW7 cab. Number 1817 was used for that. But uh, let's move on to the actual retirement. The only SW10 retired in 1991 was the 1237, retired on August 12th of 1991. And it was sold to the Peelup Brothers. Uh, two more happened in 1993. By early 1995... Uh, did I get past my switch? No, I did not. By early 1995, we were down to about uh, the end of the service life. They all been in service for about 10, 15 years by that point. Uh, there's my switch. Let's change that. And let's check the map again for a second. And you can see that our switches are now set. We're going to go past that buffer that's located right here in this track. We can't get to those five cars. And we're going to be good all the way back to our fuel siding here at Diesel Pump 1. So we're good to go here. Reverser, reverse, and go. So, um, I'm not going to go over again all the retirement information, but by July 1998, during July 1998, the last remaining 44 SW10s were retired in July 1998. Uh, and even though they were really well used and served well, they, um, Obviously had to go at some point. They had to be replaced by new items, new trains. So the remaining units were sold in July 1998. Uh, several continued operating for another two weeks after that. They were sold. Uh, they actually were the ones that were sold in July 1998, sorry. But uh, I'm trying to get the information on which uh, ones survived the preservation. I'm going to bring up the roster of them right now to find out exactly which ones all survived here. I think it was just this one, actually, that survived. Um, well, there are a few that survived, because there are some that do not have a date retired. Number 1201 apparently survived, uh, as of 2014, the information for this. Number 1201 survived. Uh, it was originally 1839. 1206 survived. Um, number 1210 survived. Number 1215 survived. And then obviously 12, well, 1229 survived as well. Number 1233 survived. 1243 is the one that we're driving, which is number 96. And those seven are the only ones that survived, it looks like. So, um... Again, there's a lot of information here, and it's a lot hard, hard to go over this information as I'm driving. I could have been doing this as post-commentary, but I didn't do that. 1229 was renumbered to 1284. I can see that. So it's now 1284. Obviously, 1243 was UP number 96, and this is the only one that took a two-digit number, it looks like. The rest seem to still maintain four-digit numbers. So there are still a few out there. If you are lucky to spot them, you can still find these guys. The ones that survived, obviously, are... Um, let me give you their numbers if you're looking for them. Uh, number 1839. 1206 kept its original numbering. 1210 kept its numbering. 1215 kept its numbering. 1229 kept its numbering. 1233 kept its numbering. And, uh, 12, four, actually, no, you know what? No. I might have wrong information on that. I'll review the notes on this after we get to the diesel point while we're filling up. So I'll review that in a moment as we're filling up. Let's get to the diesel point. 
I'll bring up my uh, gas indicator. You can see why we need gas. We're down to about uh, 218 gallons, 215 gallons here. So we're going to need a lot of gas. We'll keep this uh, head up for a moment as we get over to the uh, pump. I'm going to start slowing down within about, uh, about 3 hundredths of a mile away, I'll slow down. Okay, that's good. And a little more. That'll get me to the diesel point. And there we go. So we're ready to fill her up. And uh, I have to do this by myself, really. There's no assistant here. Okay, whatever. So we're going to just fill her up. <laughs> Okay, enough of that. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about these trains that do, did survive into uh, later life here. 1201 was renumbered to UP 1241 in 1997. I believe it's still around. Um, 1206 was renumbered to 1276 in 1997. Uh, 1208, no, that's not the one I want. Twelve ten is the next one I'm looking for, and then twelve fifteen. So twelve ten became number one two six four in nineteen ninety seven, November nineteen ninety seven. Number twelve fifteen became number one two seven four, twelve seventy four. It was apparently the second one numbered that in December of nineteen ninety seven. Uh, number one two two nine became number one two eight four in August of nineteen ninety seven. And obviously the one we're driving, number 1243, became UP96, hence the 96 on the side of our train. Uh, that happened in January of 1998. It was assigned to passenger service as UP1243 in January 1993, uh, but was retained as part of the Heritage Fleet at Cheyenne, Wyoming. So it looks like this is the only one that actually survived as, the, as a member of the Heritage Fleet. I don't think there are any other members of this train that are in the Heritage Fleet. So this is the only surviving model as far as I know. But if anyone has any information on that, please add to the comments. I'll be happy to add more information in the, uh, in the, uh, as an annotation to this video, which you can actually just make sure annotations are on and you can actually read those annotations anytime. I'll change my view now that we have, uh, 1100 gallons of fuel again. So let's change my hut. Let's make sure our switches are set to get to our next destination, which they are. That's what we're hooking up to. So we're going to head back to that right now. Let's pump the throttle up. We'll get going back there. Yeah, if you're lucky to see this train around somewhere, take a picture, because you're not going to see a lot of this model around anymore. Most of these guys are gone. What's my coupling view look like? Ah, wrong side. See, I'm riding, this is a good speed to ride the brake at, because uh, 5 to 10 is a lot, you have to play with the throttle a lot more. But once you get to 15, with the brake off, you'll lose speed a lot more when you're trying to coast. So this is a good speed to ride the brake at because you can maintain this speed very nicely, especially on this 0.6 gradient. So this is actually a very good uh, traveling speed for me right now. There's a couple of cars hanging out over here. Somebody left their uh, vehicle here while they started their shift today. I hope they, uh, well, I imagine they'll remember their vehicles are there. <laughs> I'm starting to lose speed now as our gradient is reducing to a 0 0.2. So the gradient is uh, reduced a little bit now. It's, we're still maintaining good speed though. The level one throttle is doing a good job on uh, keeping us going here. You see those two tankers there? Those are the ones we're connecting to. The other ones that were back there in the other uh, area, those three back there, we don't want those. Let's lower our speed down now that we're getting into the correct track. I need to make sure I get my speed down so I don't crash into them. 
because you don't want to derail the tankers you're connecting to. Can't drag them anywhere if you do that. Okay, we're down to five. Let's put some speed back on. You can see a train going by in the background back there. By the way, you can actually use this to show off the cars as well. Uh, so you can see those are the numbers we are looking at in the task list. And it confirms it right there. 242111, 242206. This is exactly what we're after. We should be able to couple now. There we go. And the task is complete. Reverser is back up. And we're going to have to check our path to get to our destination. This is the first uh, time we're ever really concerned about the switcher setup because there's a lot of switches to follow. And I think you have to actually have to change one of them. I think it's only just one of them you have to change, but let's um, take a look just to be sure. Our destination is here at the other diesel point. Not the one we were just at, but the other one. You can see our switches here are set correctly, so all of them are good to go. But when we get over here, we have to change this one. So now we're good to go to our diesel point and beyond. So we're going to head back into a forward position. Let's get back in the cab and, uh, well, enjoy the fact that we can't really see much here. So I'll put my head out the window again. Hey! Much better view. So I'm going to keep a level 2 throttle for a moment to get ourselves up to 50. We have no uh, real-time pressure to go here. We're just doing this casually. So there's no pressure to uh, do this quickly. I know my switches are set, so we're good to go. And if you want to be really proficient, you can actually change that uh, switch I set, the one that's up here. You can change that as you go if you're really proficient. But uh, since you should be driving the train, you shouldn't be out there changing the switch while the train is moving because then you have to try to get back in the train. Which might be possible at 15 miles per hour, but you don't want to chance it. This actually isn't the switch I was talking about. That switch goes somewhere else. But we are getting the diesel run around. That is our destination. You see the orange marker showing that that's where we want to go. That's our goal. So we are good for that. Bring it up on the map here. You can actually see the label here telling us exactly where we're going as well. The different goals, different destinations that we want to go to. So if we want to hide that, you can actually see there's our diesel run around task right there. We just have to follow our track and we will get to it. We can go 15, so I will speed up a little bit. And let's take the ball off now because we're at 14. I'm going to have to slow down soon anyway. We're going to veer to the left now because that's the switch that I set. You don't want to bump into any of the vehicles on the other tracks here. That's not what we need. I mean, we can couple to them and push them, but we don't want them. We do not want them. So when we get to 500 some miles, I'll we'll start to slow down again. You see another uh, locomotive hanging out here. No label on it, but you can see as we look at it, that is number 7702. Yeah, 7702. That looks like an ES44 AC from what I can see here. You can see uh, attached to the back of it is another one here. And there is number 3337. We're at the diesel point, so let's get an overhead view. Is that where we want to go? Or a little further? Not a little further. Actually, you know what? No, that is exactly where we want to go. What am I talking about? We are apparently at the right destination. That's apparently our diesel point. Okay. So I can just uh, unhook them here. Oh, no, I got a little more to go. I'll go a little more. I misread it. Back to the front. Not everything's going to be perfect. I mean, we could stop him here, but let's just be proper, put him in the diesel point. Well, 
Lots of squealing there. So now we got him in the right location. Let's go ahead and stop right here. Pitch forward just a little bit more. Excellent. I'll detach him here. I'll move forward a little bit so I'm separated. And then I'll come to a stop while we reassess what we're doing. So let's check our switches here, because we have to get back to turntable lead, which is all the way over here. Naturally, to get to turntable lead, you have to have a switch set to go here. But we're going to need to take this track, so we're going to come back here later. We also need this track. This was set earlier so we can get a wagon out of the uh, fueling area here. Don't need it anymore. Uh, we do need to get the switch going in this direction. So our blue track is now set to get us all the way over here. When we get over here, we're going to switch this over to there, and we're done. So we still have the orange mark on the map. We can follow the orange mark on the map for our purpose. It's not our goal, but we can still follow it. Let's get in the cab. We're going to get this thing put into its final parking spot for our scenario. So yeah, there are a couple other scenarios that we're going to see. They're part of the gas turbine pack, and then I believe... Um, if I'm not mistaken, RV Jets most likely uses the switcher himself in some of the scenarios that he has on Sherman Hill. So uh, I'm going to see if I can give you more chances to see the switcher in action by getting some of his scenarios on here. Because it's a chance to see the switcher vehicles you don't normally see on the main railroad. And sometimes you actually see them on the main railroad just because the way this, because something is, because uh, there's a shortage of uh, cabs because they're in service. The switcher has to be put into service to drag some cars somewhere. Maybe not a full train, but at least some cars. So, um,. You might see the odd time where the switcher is put into service. I'm not sure if he does that in his scenarios or not, or if any of the official scenarios do, but it'd be kind of a neat little change there, even though you have to keep your head out the window to see what you're doing. It's a neat little change to be able to do something like that. So let's check the back of the train now. Actually, that is the, that's the front end of the back of the train. So we're going to get up to our point here. I'm going to stop, start slowing down because I did not change that other switch up there. So I would derail if I go up there right now. So I need to stop right about here. No more. That is now set. Reverser is backwards. We're going to reverse into this 10. Which means I need to... Uh, not exceed 10 at this point, which means uh, a little bit more throttle work here. We don't need to get back to the buffer where we started, just into the orange mark, and we're good to go. Once I get in there, I'm going to just go ahead and stop right in the middle of it. We are in there. I'll let it go a little bit further. Then as I get above 10, I'll lower the brakes. Or add, or let the brakes take effect, rather. And there we go. Now, as you can see on our little mini-map here, I am now well within the orange spot. I'll go a little further. I'll just centralize it a little bit. So a wee bit further. There we go. You don't have to be in the center. I just, I just like trying to use the full space if I can. So I'm now in the center. That's the end of the scenario. We're just going to wait for uh, the system to process our capabilities and we're going to be out of here. So yeah, we were done at 9.09 .09 in the morning. Also, because I was giving you a tour. There's the depot in the background, by the way. We're not going to head over there right now. I think I showed you that in the uh, first scenario because we drove right by it. And a nice neighborhood over to that side. Great work. You should now be familiar with Cheyenne and how to navigate around the yard so there will be no excuses in the future. It's time we moved on to more difficult activities. Oh. Fine. Anyway, that takes us to our scenario report. Hey, there's our scenario report. So, uh, apparently I exceeded freight comfort level 0.001% of the time. I have no idea how I did that. If anyone watching this has any idea where I did that and can find out the exact moment of the video where I exceeded freight comfort level, Please tell me, because I'm curious what I did. Uh, I don't really care anyway. It's not, it's not a big deal for something like that. 
It's just if you have uh, things that are like explosive or something like that, you may not want to do that because you can, you know, make them explode. So you want to be careful with things like that. But otherwise, yeah, I don't know why that, how that happens. It just seems random that that happens sometimes. Anyway, I've done all the destinations. It took about half an hour driving it. But again, keep in mind, I did a little bit of a tour of the train before we actually uh, got the snare underway. So I counted that in my time, obviously. Uh, we only drove about two miles, which is apparently all the space we need around the yard. So there you go, two miles of yard driving. Did a circle of the yard. And that's all we did there. So we're going to go ahead next time and get into the next sitting area. But we're going to be doing the career version of Granite via Wicon. That is scenario number three in the package. It is our first career scenario. And uh, I can tell you that DTG, as far as freight scenarios go, uh, they're a little bit iffy with some of their uh, expectations. Um, let's just say that some of the timings are off on some of the scenarios. And I'll explain uh, a little bit more in future videos again what I mean by that. But you're going to see that uh, the goal at Granite in the uh, third scenario is a little questionable. It is a little questionable. I might give this another try to see if I can run it now that I know exactly how to run it. But, um, and I'll let you know if I do that. If I end up having a successful run like that, I'll let you know. But I, I, I'm happy with that run as it is, so I don't really need to. In any case... Um, You'll see what I mean when I say the timing is at Granite, and even at Mori are a little questionable. You're going to see what I mean by that. And then in Scenario 4, you're going to see that the timing for the first timing is also questionable. You're going to, again, see what I mean by that. Uh, in any case, I look forward to seeing you for these career scenarios. I'm Cyclone. Make sure you like the video. Make sure you subscribe to the channel. Make sure you come back and see those uh, beautiful scenarios here at Sherman Hill, which are just very, very unfairly done. Uh, <laughs> unfairly programmed in some aspects, but I'll see you for those. I'll talk about them when the time comes. I'm saying we'll see you next time. Have a wonderful day, night, or uh, evening, whatever it is for you at your part of the world, or morning as it is for me as I'm taping this. See you next time. Bye-bye.